It's great to be here in Barcelona with you. Um, thanks for all coming out. This is my, my second time in my life in, in Barcelona. Uh, the first was last year. I was here for Mobile World Congress, the same reason why, why I'm here this year. And it was, it was last year at Mobile World Congress that um, we first started talking about this idea that we had um, that we call internet.org to connect everyone in the world to the internet and make sure that everyone around the world has at least some basic free access to the internet. And this year we're back and we're giving an update on, on the, the progress that we've made with internet.org in, in just the last year. And I'm really excited to be able to share that there are now uh, more than 500 million people across the world who live in countries and regions where they can now get access to free basic services and internet through internet.org. Um, in just the past uh, five or six months since we really started rolling it out, there are already I think more than seven million people who have joined the internet and gotten online um, because of the programs that we're rolling out with internet.org. And I'm really excited about the work that we continue to do um, with all of the global telephone network operators and governments in different countries um, to be able to continue rolling this out. So that, that's the, the main reason why I was here uh, this week, and I'm really excited about this. It, it goes to the, the heart of what Facebook is here to do, which is help people connect around the world. Um, and while I was here, I figured we should do a Q&A, right? I mean, that, that, that would be fun. So th what we're doing with these town hall Q&As is, uh, you know, this has been a part of Facebook's culture for, for a long time. And uh, the, the reason why we've done this as part of our culture is it's really good, both as a way for uh, me to answer the questions of, you know, originally Facebook employees and people in our organization, um, but now also people in our community, right, which is what we're, we're here to do. But I also learn a lot from these Q&As, right, just being able to talk to people in our community and get your feedback and hear what you're wondering about and what your problems are with the service that we're building gives me and our team ideas about what we need to go home and go fix for, for all of you to make uh, Facebook and all the services that we build a lot better. So I, I really appreciate you guys all coming out and spending this time, and I'm looking forward to um, hearing what you're thinking about and hopefully answering some of your questions. All right, Javi. Okay. So I'll take some questions. The first question is going to be, uh, you posted in the page and was one of the most voted questions, so, and he came all the way here to ask it. So go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, hi. Um, at this moment, Google um, is really working on solar, or they're starting to put capital into solar, and they're working on a driverless car. Apple is trying to work on an electric car that might challenge Tesla, might. Uh, so I was wondering if Facebook has any ambitions in the future to leave sort of their core markets and go outside of technology, social media, internet, and maybe dabble in something a little different. Yeah, this is a good question. We're pretty focused as a company, right? I mean, our, our goal of helping everyone around the world uh, connect, I think, is pretty broad, and we're pretty mission focused in that we want everything that we do to tie back to that goal. And it's a big space. I mean, there are lots of different ways that people want to um, share and, and communicate, right? So everything from watching kind of public content that, you know, professional studios produce in terms of videos, um, that you'll find a news feed and news, to um, photos of important moments that um, happen in your life that you share with friends, uh, down to messaging and, you know, what we're doing with Facebook Messenger and WhatsApp around the world, um, which I think, you know, there are now tens of billions of messages that people are sending every day just to the people that they care about and, and want to stay connected to. So that, I think that there's a lot of different stuff in there that we want to just keep on working on and make sure that we deliver very well for our community. Um, you know, at the same time, I think that this trend, there's this clear technology trend, which is that over time, uh, people get better tools to share richer representations of the moments that they care about. So, so what do I mean? Um, if you go back five years ago, most of the content on Facebook was probably just text, right? I mean, it, you'd see the, the updates in your post would be, uh, in, in newsfeed would be text, and you'd be most likely to share maybe a status update that you typed on, your com on a keyboard on a computer. Today, most of the content that you're going to find is going to be visual, right? It's photos. And, you know, now a lot of that is because, you know, we all have phones that have cameras and it's easier to upload them and photos are a lot richer than, than text. So that's great. We can now share much deeper um, representations of wh what matters to us. My guess is that in five years, um, what we're going to see is that most of the content is actually going to be video. 
And um, that's a lot of what the, the global networks are building out is the capacity to be able to just stream video. Um, phones can also take video, and that just gives you an even richer representation of what's going on around you, and it lets you share more dynamic uh, moments that are going on. And those are kind of the main forms of content that are available today. But you, know, you can really also see what, what's going to happen beyond that. So for example, um, one thing that I'm really excited about is the work we're doing in virtual reality and augmented reality with Oculus. And that's definitely future technology in that it's not a mainstream consumer thing today. But I believe that that kind of continues this trajectory going from text to photos to videos to fully immersive um, scenes that you can be a part of and, um, and that you can construct models and different things instantaneously to show people much um, kind of richer descriptions of, of what you're thinking and what you're experiencing at that point. So I think that that's going to be something that plays out over the next five or ten years, and then there will be more beyond that. So we're definitely always researching those future things, and we're going to be working on that for a long time. But you know, everything that we do really does tie back to this mission of trying to connect the world. And I, I think even the work that we're doing on virtual reality and augmented reality and the work that we're doing on satellites and, um, and, and work to help connect people in different ways all kind of ties back to that mission. So the question number two is going to be from the thread. This is the top question we have on the page. Marceau, here's this. Um, I'm a web designer in my city, and I get more than 50 cases of fake female accounts on Facebook. Some boys use some gross pictures and make fake IDs on Facebook. So please tell me what you think about the women's security on Facebook. This is from Hitesh Sharma from India. Yeah, that's an interesting question. It's important. And uh, we have a specific issue that we've seen um, in India and a few other countries around, around this issue specifically, where in, in most countries around the world, what we see is that the number of people who use Facebook, if you split it by men and women, is about equal. And in most countries, actually, there may be uh, a handful more women because women tend to be a larger portion of the population. Um, in India, we actually see a, a, this issue where it's imbalanced, and there are more men, uh, many more men, I think, who are on the internet than, than women. And this is actually a pretty big social issue broadly. I mean, there's a lot of research that shows that empowering women um, in all countries across the world is, is really important for um, economic growth, um, spreading peace, um, and, and all kinds of social progress. And I think the fact that we kind of aren't at that state in India today is a social issue that, that Facebook can help uh, work on. We now have specific teams that are, that are working on this. But there, there are issues that we see where, um, for example, if a, if a woman creates a profile picture or creates a profile in India, sometimes, like the question asks, um, you know, there will sometimes someone will create a fake profile and, um, and mimic the, that woman and then c create issues, which, um, which is something that we are working on specific ways to get more feedback from the community to be able to address the issue of fake profiles more quickly um, especially in India where this is such a sensitive thing. But, you know, unfortunately, the, the culture, I think, needs to evolve where um, right now I, a lot of what we hear back in feedback is um, some women are afraid to set up profiles because they feel like they get blamed if someone impersonates their profile. Um, and, I mean, the, the, the saying that we, that we kind of heard when we, ha when we traveled to India and talked to people is that you can't clap without two hands, right? Somehow insinuating that maybe it's the woman's fault if, um, if, if she puts up a profile and it gets... Um, and it gets copied and, and, and spoofed, which obviously is a completely backward attitude, right? And, and is really wrong. And, um, you know, it's, it's no one's fault if someone is trying to defraud them or do something bad to them. Um, and we are basically taking a lot of steps to be able to detect this more easily um, and, and make sure that we respond very quickly. And we think this is a really important issue and one that is, is um, going to be really important for the social development of a lot of countries around the world and something that we take very seriously. Okay. So give you some more hands. We have some of the people here also. Um. Hi, Mark. Ooh, that's very loud. Um, I've got a question about, well, um, free speech and censorship and Facebook. Obviously, it's a big issue. There's a lot of things that get taken off Facebook. A lot of things get put on there. Obviously, it's incredibly difficult to police. Mm -mm. There's billions of things that get posted every day. Um, how, do you, how are you going to work with this in the next few years in the short term? Yeah. This is a really important question as well, and it's one that you know we've received a bunch of requests from um, in, in recent months, um, Turkey and Russia and Brazil, that I think have raised this question to the forefront. And so, 
you know, the principle that, that we have when we think about this is we want to give the most voice to the most people possible. So I'll explain what that means, which is, you know, there are all these things that stand in the way of people being able to share what they think. Um, there are technical limitations, right? So we talked a bit a second ago about how there are lots of people who don't have internet, right? And if you don't have internet, then um, obviously you're, you're missing some of the fundamental tools that you need to be able to share your opinion. Um, you know, there are all kinds of legal barriers that are in the way. Um, there are, each country has their own kind of standards for what content they want um, online. Um, there are other kinds of rules besides censorship, for example, intellectual property rules that um, prevent people from being able to share some stuff if it violates a copyright or a patent. Um, and then there are rules that each kind of own tool it has. So for example, Facebook has its own community standards where we don't want uh, people to share content that's going to create violence, right, or incite violence, or um, promote terrorism, or things like that. So there are all these things that, um, that basically mean that people don't have the perfect ability to express whatever they want. Um, but our goal in Facebook and everything that we do is to give the most people that we can the most ability to share as much as possible in each, in each country. So that means not only pushing on the legal framework in, in different countries to make sure that um, governments aren't censoring content that they shouldn't or don't have the right to, but it also means doing things like internet.org and pushing on making sure that everyone can get on the internet around the world. So how do we think about this overall in terms of some of the most difficult trade-offs? You know, when a country comes to us and says, um, we want you to take down this piece of content, Ultimately, we review each one of those requests very seriously, right? And um, we make sure that any request that we get is in compliance with the laws that that country has. And, and we push back anytime that we think that something is overly broad, and that's most of the time. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, if we don't comply with a country's laws, and actually if a request is in compliance with a country's laws, then what that ine inevitably is going to end with is Facebook being blocked and, you know, Facebook being down and people not being able to use Facebook to communicate for lots of legitimate causes, right? So for example, in the Turkey case or the Russia case that we had recently, um, what we saw was the requests that we received were legal. And, um, you know, we may have not agreed with them in terms of what our own policies would have been if, if we designed the laws, but we didn't, right? And, um, and what we basically saw is we have tens of millions of people using Facebook in these countries um, on a day-to-day -day basis, relying on the tools to uh, share moments that are really important with, um, with their family, um, run their business and communicate with customers, um, and have good civil um, and civic discourse with government leaders on a whole range of other topics. And the problem that we had was if we had uh, denied the, the government's request to, to take down that content, um, even though they had the legal authority to do that, then they probably would have just blocked Facebook and we would have, not, we would have removed the ability for all these other people to exercise their voice as well. So this is what I mean when I say the most voice for the most people, which is, you know, sometimes there are, there are things that we don't agree with and would like um, to be able to push further. I'd like to get more people on internet.org sooner so that way more people have access to the internet and better tools. Um, you know, I would probably, if I were designing these laws, there would be fewer censorship and, and different rules around the world, but, but I'm not, and that's probably good um, because, you know, each, each country needs its own, its, its own government. Um, but that's, that's kind of our philosophy on this, is we, we want to have... Um, the most voice for the most people. And that's what you can expect us to continue working towards in the future. Hi, Mark. Uh, I'm Hazel. Uh, thanks for coming out to Barcelona. Uh, what I wanted to ask is, you were speaking just now about empowering women, which mm -hmm. is fabulous. Um, and I was really interested to know what it's like working with a powerhouse that is Sheryl Sandberg. And uh, what are some of the things that you've actually put in place as part of her legacy? Legacy. I mean, um, well, first of all, it's awesome. I mean, uh, some of the time people ask me, who are my outside mentors and who do I learn from? And the, the real answer to that question is I learn the most, not from anyone who is an advisor, but actually the people I work with on a day-to-day -day basis. And Cheryl would be at the top of that list. I mean, she's just an amazing person um, who, in addition to her work building Facebook's business, right, and, and she really, I, I think, gets a lot of credit for building up um, the tools that we've done internally to support millions of businesses around the world. We just announced uh, last week that there are now two million um, businesses that advertise on, on Facebook. And a lot of that really is the teams that, that she has built, um, and it's, it's amazing. I mean, when I started Facebook, I didn't 
really know a lot about that side of things. I, I mostly um, came at it from this mission perspective of wanting to build tools that connect people um, and give people all the, the, the tools that they need to share um, and building products in the computer science. But in terms of business and, um, and just thinking about how you build a healthy organization, um, she's a pretty amazing person and has been an amazing mentor for me and one of the people I've really learned the most from on this voyage. Um, when you ask about legacy, it's kind of a funny thing because I, I think, you know, we're, you know, I, I really enjoy working with her and I, um, I think we both plan on doing that for a long time. So, um, so I don't know if, if we're thinking about her legacy any more than we're thinking about mine or anyone else's at this point, but um, I, I think we're both really optimistic about our, our mission of connecting everyone around the world and if we succeed at that and continue to make more progress, that is something that we're, we're both deeply proud of. Hello, Mark. Uh, my name is Karthik. I'm from uh, Social Blood. Uh, we're also a proud partner of Internet.org in India. Uh, uh, I, I worked in the blood banking industry for a while now, and uh, I'm asking this question on behalf of all the people working on the problem globally. Facebook uh, has been really active in... Um, helping solve really big social problems like blood donations, uh, no, not blood donations, sorry, the organ donations and uh, helping to find missing children uh, through Amber Alerts and recently uh, the suicide prevention tool. And uh, Mark, you proved that Facebook is not just a tool just to connect with people, but also a tool that lets the community uh, uh, to, to do good in the world. And uh, my question is, um, is Facebook Will Facebook in the future take up the challenge of blood donations and help solve a problem that is affecting millions of people around the world? Thank you. Yeah, this is definitely the kind of problem that we want to work on or work with partners who, who are working on it, like your organization, I think, is doing amazing work. So thank you for that. Um, you know, one of the big types of, of social good projects that Facebook tries to take on are ones that require coordinating um, a large number of people. So for example, um, when a lot of folks were worried about the Ebola epidemic that was spreading, um, we used Facebook to be able to raise a bunch of money to help out. Uh, th that's the type of thing that, you know, being able to get something in front of people and, and um, coordinate a handful of people to have a response was, was pretty helpful. Um, another example is, you know, unfortunately sometimes there are disasters, right? I mean, earthquakes, typhoons, that kind of thing. And one thing that we built was the ability for people to coordinate in a crisis, right? Because what you, the first thing you want to know if um, you hear that there's been an earthquake or some natural disaster in a city is, are the people I care about okay, right? Are, is my family okay or my, are my close friends okay? And that's a coordination problem too, right? So rather than having everyone have to call every other person, we created this board where everyone can just go and say, I'm cool, right? I'm okay. And then all the people that, that they care about can go and see that and, you know, they might see the updated news feed or they might just be able to go to the board and see which of their friends and the people that they care about have responded. Um, you know, raising money for different organizations is similar. Um, and that's something that I, that I think we've empowered a lot of different folks to be able to do through Facebook. And, and we're, we're planning on doing more there as well. Um, and, and even things like Amber Alerts, um, helping find um, children who have who've gone missing or have been kidnapped, that's something that you can crowdsource pretty well because, you know, there's a good chance that someone in the region has seen something. And if, if um, they can tip off the police, then that gives um, the police, then that gives a much better increase, uh, a much um, increased chance. Um, so there are all these things like this. And, you know, blood donations and bone marrow donations follow the same pattern, which is their, their coordination problems, um, especially bone marrow where you need someone who's a very specific match um, for, for your own body. So that, that is the kind of thing that we would love to be able to help out on. Um, we're really proud that we're supporting your organization with internet.org in India, and um, if we can help out more in the future, we would love to. There's a lot of very important questions. I'm going to throw one that some friends were asking me today, Mark. So Because, you know, people in the company ask all sorts of questions. So they were asking me today, this is the third time you come back to Spain. There's got to be something keeping you coming back. What's that? <laughs> Um, so besides Mobile World Congress and Internet.org, probably the ham. <laughs> um, but, you know, I'm thinking about that when, because Javi's asking this. You know, we, there's this really funny story that we have where Javi and I have been working together for a long time, and a few years ago, 
I guess it was my birthday. You, you sent me this really nice jamon, right? And it was, um, and, and you, you got it, you sent it in the mail, and it was one of the, it was like, I think the pig had only eaten acorns its whole life or something ridiculous like that. So it was like a really nice piece of ham. So, um, but we made the mistake where you, you sent it in the mail to me. And, you know, a lot of folks, like, you know, people in the U.S. don't know what this is. They're not used to getting delivered, like, a leg of ham right in the mail. <laughs> so, um, so people, so, so we basically received this thing, and, um, and I guess someone who was, who was receiving it was like, I don't know what this is. Like, is this a bomb? Right? So, <laughs> so they just shredded it and, and, ba- and destroyed it. And then at the end, they're like, oh, it's safe. No bomb. They're like, oh, yeah, thanks, but you destroyed my ham. So, um, so that, day, that keeps me coming life. back to Spain. That was the saddest day of my life. <laughs> anyway, you wanted to ask a question. Okay. Hello, my name is Mark, I'm 15. And you were talking about mentors. And I want to ask you, what's the best tip you can give to young people with great ideas to change the world? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So, the, you know, there, there are two things that I would say. The most important thing, I think, is just to have faith in yourself and trust yourself. Right? The, the experience that I had, so I started Facebook when I was 19. And one of the experiences that I had was that you hear a lot when you're really young that you don't have enough experience to do things, right? And that you... Um, you know, there, there are people who have more experience than you and, um, and you should defer to them or let them do it or let them run your company or, um, you know, any, any number of things that basically the message is, um, you know, whether people are trying to be encouraging or not, the, what the real undertone is you don't have the experience to do this. But what, what I think this misses is that each person has a unique perspective, right? So, you know, it may be true that as a young entrepreneur, you don't have decades of business experience working inside a company, knowing how to manage people in that kind of environment. But, I mean, in my example, when I was 19, I had different experience that was pretty unique, right? I was, you know, one of the people in the, the one of the first people to grow up in a generation um, who had the internet for most of their life, right? Which is, is a pretty different thing. So you're native to the internet. You, you like, think about stuff in a pretty different way. Um, and... I had this perspective of maybe being unencumbered by a lot of the business knowledge that a lot of other people um, had that told me that I should just focus on the product, right, and the experience. And if you build something that people really like, then that's enough, right, and you'll learn the rest of the stuff later. Um, But I think more than that, just believing in in what you're doing, um, I I think has actually been the biggest thing when I just think about Facebook's experience, right? I mean, I, I often think about, you know, why, you know, we're 11 years into this now, why was Facebook the company that, uh, that built this social network, right? And, you know, there were all these other companies that had way more experienced engineers um, that were already serving hundreds of millions of people and had uh, millions of servers and all this infrastructure, so, so why was that? And, you know, I actually think when, when I look back on it, just, I just believed in what we were doing more, right? So at each step along the way, there are going to be people who say, all right, you know, what you're doing, in our case, Facebook, that's just for kids. Only kids are going to like that. That's not going to be a big deal. Or, okay, fine. So some more people are, are, are into it now, but it's a fad, right? It'll probably not be around for that long. It's like, oh, okay, fine. So it's going to be around for a little while, but you're never going to make any money doing that. Your business isn't going to be sustainable. And so basically all these other companies and people who had more experience, who had the opportunity to build what, what we ended up building, didn't because their experience told them things that ended up being wrong. And I think being, um, having a fresh perspective on this is extremely important and in a lot of ways is really valuable. Um, so don't discount yourself, I think, is the most important thing that everyone needs to kind of think about, no matter what you're doing, whether you're an entrepreneur or anything else. Um, you know, everyone has a unique perspective that, that um, you can bring to doing something unique in the world, and um, just don't lose sight of that. Hi. So my name is Rosa, and um, yeah, I work in the meetings and events industry. And I've used Facebook to live stream my events, to market them. So I was wondering, what's your vision on working with, with events? Like, because I know that there is a lot of potential, and you do some things, but 
I'm with, talking with about, what kind of events? Yeah, I'm talking. Well, I work in corporate events mostly, so mostly B two B, B two C. Yeah. Well, I mean, one of the the most used products at Facebook is events, right? I mean, it's um, it you know, it isn't like newsfeed in that it might not be what you do ten times a day, but I, I think um, Facebook events product is something that uh, hundreds of millions of people use every month to coordinate events and. Um, you know, lar they're, they're often bigger events, right? So not, you're probably not going to use Facebook events today if you're trying to plan lunch with a friend. But if you're trying to plan a birthday party or if you're an artist and you're trying to get the word out about um, a bar that you're playing at um, or if you're, you know, trying to create a party and get people to come or a corporate event like what you're talking about, um, Facebook events actually is a great product for that today and something that people are using pretty successfully. So we'll, we'll keep on working on that and making it a, a bigger thing. But... Um, but for today, I, I actually think you, you have a tool that's pretty good. <laughs> I try to keep memory of everyone raising their hands, but it's getting tough. It's a lot of you guys. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you very much uh, for this Q&A. Uh, I'm Muriel. I'm a student of business in Barcelona. Uh, Facebook is one of the most attractive companies in the world. And I'm sure that many people would like to work in your company. Uh, including myself. <laughs> um, so, um, what do you think is the key to attract and select right people to work in your company? Um, so, attract and select are different parts of the problem. So, in terms of attracting people, so I actually think one of the most important things is, um, is just being upfront about what you stand for. You know, Facebook is not a company for everyone in the world. Right? I mean, we, we have a very strong opinion on the change that we want to create in the world. We believe that the world will be better when everyone has the ability um, to share what they, what they think and to be able to connect with their friends um, and to be able to connect with the whole world. And there are plenty of people out there who, um, who have disagreements with that vision right? and think that, um, that there are risks and, and all kinds of different things, and, and we work hard to, to mitigate those and take all that feedback into account. But at the end of the day, we just believe very strongly that connecting the world um, and, and helping people connect gives people the tools they need to build stronger relationships and stay in touch with the people they care about. Um, it helps people start businesses. It helps businesses get created um, and, and grow. That, that can help grow the economy. And I, I also think that connecting the world is important for governance over time and, and making it so that people can have good dialogue about civic issues um, and can, can talk to the, the leaders who represent them in, in their country. And, um, and I believe very strongly that that's good for the world. And if you believe that, then Facebook is a good company for you. And if you don't, then um, maybe find a different one. Um, <laughs> now, the, on the selection side, that's, that's kind of a completely different thing, which is you, know, you, you run into this challenge when you're running any kind of organization, but it doesn't need to be a big company. It could be, you know, small business where you have five people, where um, there's always this pressure where there's always more work than you have people to do. And that leads you to want to get people in to, to help you out and do that work, even if they're not the very best people. So one of the things that you always need to be very careful about is having a check in place so that you only really hire the best people. Right, it, despite this pressure where you always know that you know, maybe you could compromise a little bit on quality today um, and still get a bunch of better work done in the next six months because there's so much more to be done. Uh, but over the long term, you're really only going to be better off if you, if you get someone really good. And you know, the heuristic that I use for this, so I, I've developed over time a, a simple rule, which is that I will only hire someone to work directly for me if I would work for that person. And it's a pretty good test, right? I mean, it doesn't necessarily mean that I'm rushing to give up my job as running the company and, and, and put other people in the, in the role. But what it does mean is that um, in, an, in an alternate universe, right, if things were different and I didn't start the company, I would be happy to work for that person, right? Or if Facebook just disappeared and I had to go find something else to go do, that I would be happy to go work for that person. And, um, you know, we talk about some of the people here. I mean, there was a question earlier about, about Cheryl, who I've learned a huge amount from. And, I mean, absolutely, right? I mean, she is wonderful and absolutely fits that. Javi is one of the people um, who I work most closely with. He's one of the top people at Facebook and focuses on um, spreading Facebook around the world and now helping to grow the Internet, too. And it's absolutely, right? In a different situation, I mean, I, I would just learn so much. 
And um, I think as long as you have that as your role, as your rule for picking the people that you work with, you're not going to go wrong, right? And if you're building a big organization, then um, it also works many layers down, right? If each person is only hiring people that to work directly for them who they would work for, then you're probably going to get a pretty strong organization. So I, th I think this rule has served me pretty well. Hi, Mark. Pierre. Uh, my name is Awa, and I would like to ask you two questions. First of all, why we don't have Wi-Fi here? <laughs> That's first. Why don't we have Wi-Fi here? And secondly, um, so my generation, this generation has been born in, in the social media. How can we contribute to Facebook to make it better? All right, well, the second question might be easier for me to answer than the first one. Um, this isn't my building. Um, I don't know why they don't have Wi-Fi. Um, but, you know, sorry. Um, fortunately, you probably have good mobile networks that you can access anyway instead. Um, in, in terms of your, your second question about how you can contribute, you know, you know, we're all blessed with this ability where we can, in this generation, share what we think and build things and get them adopted way faster than at any other period in history. Right? It's not an accident that you know, Facebook, our community, reached a billion people um, faster than any other product or service in the world had. And I would guess that the next service that's going to reach a billion people will probably reach it faster than Facebook did. Right? And I mean, part of what is, is awesome about the world that we all live in, and this is part of the value of, of having the world be connected, um, not only through social media so that everyone has the ability to share um, what, what, they, what they care about and pass along things that they think are awesome, but also just physically connected um, with everyone or, or more and more people having the Internet, um, is it, it means that whatever you do, whatever ideas you have, um, whatever beliefs you share, um, whatever products you build, you know, whether it's something that can be universal and everyone can, can build, or you know, let's say you're building a restaurant in a city and you want to get the word about, out, about what you're doing, um, now you, you are more empowered to do that. Right? And, and you can use these tools. And you know, I, I think that that's a pretty profound thing. And it's, it's so different from, um, from what previous generations have had that you know, I just feel like, personally for me, I feel like if I don't wake up every day and use the opportunity that, that I have to, um, to just build great services in this environment, then I'm just squandering this awesome opportunity. And, um, and I, I feel like it's probably the same for almost everyone else here, which is, you know, you all have so many tools that a generation ago um, people would have died to have, right? And, you know, and I, I just think we all, you know, as, as, a, as a generation and, and people have a responsibility to make sure that we um, do the best that we can for the world and the next generation that's coming after us. And uh, for me, that means helping to connect everyone. But for each other person here, it, you probably have a different vision for how you can improve the world, and you need to go do that. Hi, Mark. Nice to meet you. Uh, my name is Noga. I'm from Israel, and I'm working in Facebook project here in Barcelona for an outsourcing company. Um, here in Barcelona, we are 160 employees, giving client support and lead generation for EMEA market. Only a small portion of high spender advertisers from this market are managed in Facebook Dublin, which means the largest portion of EMEA Facebook clients are in direct contact with us, the outsourcing employees. Last week, we were informed that the project is closing on the 24th of April, and we are all going to lose our jobs. I want to mention that most of us have graduated from universities, are very devoted to Facebook project, and would like to continue working for this great platform. My two questions are, uh, one, is there anything you can do to help us, my colleagues and I, not losing your jobs? And two, the business model of an outsourcing company is giving services to organization was created back in the 80s, and is used today by many big companies globally. The disadvantage is that the organization cannot have full control and supervision of the outsourcing service, as well as maintaining a unified business policy. In addition, lower costs hurt employees' working condition. Do you think organization can start using a new equitable business model that will be fair enough for all parties involved? And if so, do you think Facebook can start making this change? So, yeah. Um, 
So it's a really good question, and I'm glad you asked. And this is why we do these Q&As, so people can ask hard questions and, and I can hear what, what people are thinking about. Um, so the first thing I, I just want to say is, I, I mean, it's really tough, obviously, to, um, to lose your job. So I'm, so I'm sorry for the, the personal situation that you're in. Um, you know, the way that, that we think about this at, at Facebook is we want to serve our community and our customers um, as best as possible. And um, a lot of why we're bringing this in-house um, is because that gives us the ability to, to train people more directly and a lot of the things that are the flip side of the outsourcing uh, model that you, that you talked about. So, you know, Facebook, one of the things that you may not actually know is um, a huge portion of our company is actually based in Europe. We have, um, we have our international headquarters is based in, in Dublin. Um, we have big offices um, in London and Hamburg, I think, as well. Um, almost 20% of Facebook employees are in, are in Europe and, and work in Europe and, and serve people um, in Europe, our, our community and our customers here, and, um, and the Middle East as well and, and nearby regions. Um, so it's, it's an area that we have a huge investment in. We have several very large offices that we're very committed to growing. Um, they're very diverse and, and help us serve people all over the world who speak a, a variety of different languages um, and are in different communities. And, um, and we're committed to continuing to do that better. Um, you know, the situation that you're talking about is, is a really tough one, right? And, I mean, we take it very seriously. Unfortunately, you know, sometimes when you're running a company, you, you're working with some company and you have a contract with them, and then um, that contract ends and you decide that you can either try to do it better yourself or you work with a different contract, uh, a different company instead, and sometimes that results in, in people losing jobs, and, and that is bad, right? And, and like, I mean, and that, it's never obviously our goal to have that be the outcome, but um, the, the North Star for us is we're always focused on just trying to serve our community the best that we can. Um, we are continually investing, especially in Europe, but around the world as well, um, to build up our teams to do this, um, and we're going to continue doing that. But um, I apologize for your personal situation. Hi, Mark. Uh, this is Rajesh. Um, I have one question. I'm not against hate speech. Oh, sorry. I'm not against free speech, but I'm against hate speech. So I have seen there are situations where people post fake or lies, you know. So I want to know what's Facebook doing to become a medium, you know, to stop becoming a medium to spread lies. Uh, I have reported many uh, comments or posts from people to Facebook, but I have not heard anything from Facebook. So I don't know what, uh, what Facebook does when, they, when it receives a complaint from any user. And what's yeah. your future plan? Yes, this is a great question, too. So what are we doing to stop the spread of lies? Um, this is tricky, right, because lies, what the line is between something which is factually untrue and what is a disagreement of opinion um, is not always a black and white line. And a lot of free speech and, or just free expression, giving people the tools that they need to express what they want, often means sharing things that people disagree with. Um, so where's the line between stuff that's untrue or stuff that's hateful? Um, we have certain rules around this, right, where especially on the hate speech side, um, you know, there, anything that is trying to incite violence or terrorism, we just take down immediately, right? So, and, and part of how we do this is we don't police our own system. Um, it, it would be impossible for us to have someone who is reading every single post that gets posted. So what we do is instead um, our community of, you know, more than a billion people are pretty good about reporting things. And especially if something gets reported a few times, then, um, then it gets to the top of the list of things that we're going to look at. And, um, and, and if it falls into any of these categories, then we'll take it down. Um, the hate speech stuff is, is a little bit different from what you're talking about in terms of lies. But we also actually are doing something to curtail that. And, you know, we don't want to block people from, from sharing something on Facebook, even if it's untrue, right? But what we do want to make sure is that we're giving people the best content in newsfeed, right? I mean, people are, you know, you come to Facebook because you want to get the best updates um, about what's going on with the people you care about and what your friends are talking about in the world. And what we have found is when someone shares a story that ends up being a hoax, right, and they end up being tricked and share something or it's a scam, then the number of people who report those stories um, is much higher than, than a normal post. Uh, so what we found statistically is it's about two and a half times more people will report something that's a hoax. Um, so either a scam or just kind of blatantly not true and verifiable. 
And um, what we can do when things are reported is we just show them less frequently in newsfeed, right? So, but again, I mean, this, this is, it's, it's important to take into account that, you know, there's things that people report that end up actually being good. Um, those tend to be reported less, right? So if someone says something that's politically controversial that isn't a hoax, um, we'll actually generally find that that will get reported less, and therefore we do show that just the same amount that we would show anything else in newsfeed. But, um, but for something that's a hoax that our community is really identifying isn't true, um, we're not going to take it down because you have the right to share it generally. Um, so that means that if someone wants to go to your page, they can find it. If they scroll down for, through newsfeed, they can find it. Um, but we're not going to be putting that on the top of people's newsfeeds if the signal that we have from our community is that something is wrong. A lot of really good and serious questions, but I'm, I'm going to pick up one from the Facebook page, which is really good. I'm, I don't know if it's so serious, but it's from Carmen in Florida. Can we get more pictures of Beast? Of Beast? Yes. So Beast, Beast is, is my dog. dog. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, yeah, I probably should post more pictures of Beast. <laughs> So one of the things that I try to do is I want to use all of our products, right? Because we have this, this saying inside Facebook, um, eating your own dog food, right? Which is that, you know, if it's, um, it's kind of a silly saying, but the, the basic idea is, you know, if, if you're eating kind of good human food and you're just feeding something else to your dog, then you never know what your dog's experience is, right? So it, you want to be, in order to serve our community as best as possible, we don't want to ever have something where we're just building it, but you know, most people in the company aren't actually using it. Right? It's, if, if there are bugs, um, if something is slow, we want to experience that pain firsthand because that's going to be, in addition to the feedback that we hear from everyone in our community, that encourages us to change stuff. So one of the things that I did was I, I opened up a page for my dog, Beast, because you know, I, don't, um, you know, I don't run the, the Facebook page, um, but I, I really wanted to know what it was like to run a page, right, and build up a community around something that you're doing. Um, so my dog, I think, is pretty cute. Um, he, he's a mop. All right, so he, he's a Hungarian sheepdog. He's, he's, if, if you look up his page later, I'm pretty confident you'll be amused by, by him. He, he basically has dreadlocks, um, and he's awesome. And he has two million fans on Facebook. And um, <laughs> because I very diligently over the years managed his, his page and you know, I'm like Beast's number one photographer, and I'm always trying to find witty things to say. And I guess recently I've just been a little busy running Facebook and trying to spread the internet and all that. But, um, but I got to get back on that because I do view this as part of my responsibility is to use pages um, and to use all of our products. So that way I know what you know. If you're a business and you're trying to use Facebook to build a community and communicate with your customers, um, what your own experience around that is. Hi, Mark. My name is Christina. So I'm creating my own company right now, and I wanted to ask from your personal experience how and when you start delegating to, another pe to other people so, you don't, so you're not scared of losing the personality of your own idea, and if you still have the last word of all big decisions in Facebook. Thank you. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and I think different people have different management styles on how you delegate. And um, I mean, in general, as, as, a, as a general rule of management, if you get someone who's really good um, as part of your team, then they need the ability to fully kind of exercise all their creativity and all their capacity, or else they're not going to be having the biggest impact that they can have on the world, and then they're going to want to go do something else. So in general, you know, delegating is good. Um, when you're hiring people. But th I actually think the most important thing is to, is to actually keep your team as small and flexible as possible. One of the things that I'm the most proud of that, that Facebook has done is, you know, we serve more than a billion people around the world, and our team um, has fewer than 10,000 people. And it, it's pretty amazing. I mean, that by itself is something that it's only possible because of um, of modern technology, and it means that, you know, th there's this general idea that, like, as companies get big, they get bloated, and you get slow, and they become bureaucracies, and you stop being able to get a lot of stuff done. So I actually think one of the best things you can do to be able to, um, to stay nimble and actually remain flexible and be able to make whatever decisions you want to about the direction of your organization is to, um, is to stay small and flexible. And, you know, so part of the way that I was able to do that was, I mean, I wrote all the code originally for the first 
a um, couple of years of Facebook. And, you know, I brought people on and I delegated to them um, when we needed to, but I didn't, you know, my first move when I was building Facebook wasn't to hire a team of engineers to go build a product. Um, I, I generally, each step along the way, have tried to do as much as I, as I can myself or as much as our team can um, by itself without necessarily trying to take on more people. I find that that's both more fulfilling for the people that you have because they feel more um, challenged and stretched and have the ability to have a very big impact. Um, and small organizations tend to be nimbler and, and give you more flexibility in terms of directions that you would want to go in. Eh, hola, mi nombre es Francisco y mi pregunta es porque hemos montado una startup de geolocalización sobre ofertas de tu punto de geolocalización y ofrecemos un servicio de Big Data. ¿Tú qué pensarías? Porque sé que el, eh, Facebook ha mirado mucho lo que es geolocalización y el Big Data. ¿Qué piensas sobre esto? So, this is Francisco and he just started a startup and they are focused on geolocation and Big Data. So, what are your thoughts on Big Data geolocation, where that's going. Um, I mean, that is a very broad question. <laughs> do you, is there something more specific that you want to hear about, or do you want me to just go for it? ¿Qué pensarías sobre la geolocalización? ¿Cómo ofrecer datos estadísticos a las empresas en general sobre Todo. Categoría de todo. <laughs> es un poco grande, pero es... So he, he, he is thinking how can you share all types of data with uh, companies in the geolocation space. Exacto. Okay. <laughs> more or less. <laughs> so, so, so he's talking about how, how can we share more statistical data for companies in the geolocation space, maybe some aggregated <laughs> statistics. <laughs> Sino que pensar sobre el futuro de los servicios de geolocalización a, a de, de los servicios que se le ofrecen dentro de las empresas. So what are you thinking? El servicio a las empresas. De geolocalización. <laughs> Perdón, Omar. So, All right, I'm just going to go for it. even in Spanish. <laughs> okay. Um, I think I understand what you're asking, yeah. right? Which is, um, you know, so one of the things that I'm really excited about for the future, and, and jump in if I'm just a answering the wrong question, right? So if, 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 I'm, if I'm not doing what you, if I'm not answering the question that you have. Um, you know, one of the things that I talked about a bit earlier is in the future there are going to be all these different ways that people can share, right? And if you look back five years, um, we were pretty constrained and most of the content that we shared was text, and now we have photos, and we're going to get videos, um, and there's all this other rich content. We can augment what we're sharing with location and see who's around us. Um, in the future, we're going to be able to create whole scenes in virtual and augmented reality. And then there are going to be, there are other things that are going to be even more immersive and deeper after that. And what each of these require is the ability to, um, to basically be able to uh, handle more and more content, right? So it, if you're, um, if you, if you want to be able to um, help people share videos, then, you know, the technology to be able to do that is, is, um, is big, right? And, and there's a lot of, infrastructure that you need to be able to build, to be able to stream that um, and, and make that work out. Location is an area that I'm really personally excited about um, because there are all these services that just were not possible 10 years ago to build, but that now that we all have um, phones and a lot of the phones are powered with location, there are things that you can do. So, um, you know, for example, one of the, the tools that we already have on Facebook that it's only rolled out to a small portion of our community, but, but a number of people are using this, is the ability to have um, an ambient sense of um, where your friends are, right? So it doesn't like put them on a map, but it basically says, okay, what, what city are they in or what town are they in? And it'll let you know if someone who, who normally is out of town um, is, is nearby, right? And that's pretty cool, right? Because, you know, not all of my family lives right next to me. And, you know, I have friends who live in New York. And when they come out to visit California, um, I can get a notification that someone who isn't normally around um, is at least in the city, and if, they, if they've turned it on, and that's really good, right? And, and of course, everyone needs full control over that, so people have to turn that on. It's not something that's just going to be on in the background. But, um, but overall, you know, that requires understanding a lot of context, right? So we need to, in order to be able to send me that notification when my friend from out of town is in town, we need to know that um, 
that person lived in a different place, right? So it's actually, it's not normal that, that, that he was out in California. He was normally in New York because, you know, if it was someone who I work next to every day, then sending me a notification that they're next to me would be pretty annoying. Um, so that's important. And then, I mean, you need to know that it's a person who I really care about, right? So, I mean, I have, you know, almost a thousand friends on Facebook. And if it was someone who I didn't care about that much, then I probably wouldn't want to get a notification. But because, you know, it's someone who I work closely with or someone in my family, then that's good. So all this stuff requires understanding a pretty clear picture of, of what is going on with you and the people that you care about. And that's a lot of what we work on. But we're really sensitive about only doing what people want us to do and giving people control over all of this. So, you know, we're not going to be tracking someone's location unless they specifically say, please track this because I, I want people to, I want to know where people are around me and, um, and I want my friends to be able to know. Um, and, and similarly, right, I mean, you can go into an interface on Facebook on your profile and see every single thing that you've ever shared or that is in Facebook about it. And you can, you can wipe it. You can delete the whole thing. Um, you can delete different points of it. But I mean, this is pretty deep in our principles of how we operate as a company is every person needs to have complete control over all of the context that, um, that our system understands in order to build pro products. And you guys get control over that. So I hope I answered the question that you were asking. I tried my best. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Okay, so we have only time for one last question, unfortunately. Um, so. Hello, my name is Judith. Good afternoon. I'm so happy for being here. And this is going to be a historical moment in my life. And I would like to ask you a favor if we can take a picture to add to my favorite wall, please. <laughs> can we? <laughs> oh, this is so sad. I, um, <laughs> I, I, I tr if I do that, then I'm going to miss my flight. Because I, I can't just take a photo with you. I mean, that's not, that's not fair. I would end up taking a photo with, with everyone here. Um, and I'm actually I'm taking off right after this. So, um, so here's what you can do. Um, there's going to be a video that is going to have us, me, answering your question right now. And, um, and you can take a screen cap of that. And, uh... All right. and that's your photo. All right, let's see if we have time for one more question before we, we wrap up. Hi. I'm, uh, hi, Mark. Um, first of all, I'm a huge fan, huge, huge fan, and this has been like the most historical moment of my life too. So, uh, <laughs> this is uh, one question which which would like you to imagine a little, and consider yourself as someone who's uh, studying with us and in a, in a business school. Having known that Facebook has already been uh, established by someone else, what business idea or what internet idea would be, you be working on right now? when you know that as revolutionary as Facebook, something's already existing? Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's a good question. Um, you know, I, I just, wanting to connect people is a pretty deep thing for me, right? I, I, it's something that I've cared about since I was a kid. Uh, my mom told me these stories that, you know, a lot of boys when they're younger, have like Ninja Turtles or some toys and they're all like fighting. And I just wanted to make them connect and, and, and like <laughs> form villages and be peaceful and, um, and communicate. And I was like, why can't you guys just talk to each other and work out your problems? Why do you need to be kicking each other? Um, so, you know, th this is something that I've cared about for a long time. Um, and, you know, the reality is that Facebook is not a static thing, right? So Facebook 11 years ago when we got started in, in 2004, um, was very different, right? I mean, it was, it was mostly on the web, whereas today it's mostly mobile and apps. Um, it was, you know, I mean, we talked about how most of the content today is visual, right? Photos, links, that kind of content, video in the future. Um, you know, back when Facebook started, we didn't even have news feed, right? So there weren't even text updates, right? There was just profiles. And, you know, so it's changed a lot over the, t over the years, right? And I think that it will continue changing a lot in the future, right? With things that we're, we're doing, um, especially around, um, you know, virtual reality and augmented reality and really more immersive moments and the ability to share more things um, in real time and just get a better and better sense of what is going on with you and you'll be able to share that with your family and all the people that you care about. So I don't know. I think the, the, the reality is even if Facebook existed today, it isn't what is going to exist in the future. More needs to be done, right? And, you know, the majority of people in the world are not connected 
and, um, and they need to be connected, right? And, and that's, I think, a, a fundamentally important thing for our generation, right? Um, you know, when people have the ability to stay connected with all the people they care about and love, um, it helps you live a, a richer life. Um, you know, when people have the ability to, to build businesses that can connect more easily with new customers and their existing customers, um, the economy grows better, um, more jobs are created, there's more prosperity. I mean, this stuff is all good and I think needs to continue happening. So I actually think the honest answer is that even if Facebook already existed and I just had to do something new, I would still find another way to help people connect because that's just, that's who I am and that's what I, what I care about and, and what I feel like I need to do. So, all right. I will be back in Barcelona probably next year for Mobile World Congress. So maybe we'll get a chance to do it again. All right, thank you guys. See ya. Before you leave, let's take a picture with you on the side of the room so they get it. Okay. All right. We're, we're going to take one big group picture. So. Oh, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Everyone stays back. All right. Every, but everyone should sit. I'm gonna, I was going to come to you. I should have clarified that. Okay. <laughs> I'll take a picture with Mark in the background. <laughs> You guys should sit down so we can take the take sit the down. photo. You guys sit down. Yeah, that's what you do. All right. In your original seats. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Mike. Okay. Mike. Sit down. One second. One, two. Let's do a panorama. So everyone can see that. Okay. We got it. All right. Thank you. Thanks, guys. See ya.